The Gift of Gab Show, your go-to lifestyle podcast, covering everything from psychology and relationships to politics and current events. Live from Chicago, it's The Gift of Gab Show. Here's your host, Gabby Smith. Divorce. It's very personal and all too common. In the United States, most of us have heard that statistic. You know, 50% of marriages end in divorce. But why is that? Well, here with me today is a dear friend, Dana Michelle. She recently finalized her divorce about seven years of marriage and three years of dating prior to marriage. With two small children, she will discuss her personal story and how she navigated through her situation. Welcome to the Gift of Gab show, Dana. How are you? I am doing great, Gabby. Thank you so much for having me here today. Oh, I like that. You sound to be in good spirits. You finalized your divorce. Life is good, huh? Life is great. Oh, girl, I love it. Well, you know what? Let's start it from the beginning. How did you find out that your husband wanted a divorce? Sure. Uh, My husband got laid off in 2012. He was an investment banker, and okay. we knew each other in college. Okay. We uh, dated and met through mutual friends. Uh, we dated for three years in Atlanta and moved to Chicago when I got into law school. And we dated for three years and got married in 2007 mm-hmm. uh, and were married for seven years. Our divorce was finalized in March of 2014. Wow. He got laid off from his job in 2012, and I personally believe that many men have their self-esteem tied up into their careers, Mm -hmm. and I think that that was very troubling for him. He decided when he got laid off that he would start his own business. Okay. What was problematic for me was that we didn't discuss the next steps after he got laid off. Okay. And I felt that he made a unilateral decision with what should have been a team decision. Mm -hmm. So I felt like our marriage took a turn for the worst uh, upon him being laid off in 2012. He was unemployed for two years while he started his business. And during that time, I spent the majority of the time running the household. I'm an attorney. I am in-house counsel for a large technology consulting firm. And in addition to my job, I was also running the household. And that became problematic for me. So in those two years, you know, you're running the household. You've got your attorney work you're, you're doing. You've got two small kids. What was he doing in those two years? So talk to me about that. Chilling. <laughs> and that's what was so problematic for me. Uh, as a as a woman, you want to stand by your man. You mm. want to support your man. And I kept saying to myself, what would Coretta do? Coretta Be- Scott King. Coretta Girl, Scott King. Come to me. Tell me about it. Because what? my man had a dream mm-hmm. and wanted to start his own business, mm-hmm. wanted to run his own business. Okay. The problem with that, though, is that he wasn't taking care of me as a husband should take care of a wife. And how, how do you define that? So how should a husband take care of a wife? Reassurance that things were going to be okay. Okay. Uh, stepping up around the house mm-hmm. to take care of the children. Mm-hmm. For a while, I was the sole breadwinner for, for two years. Wow. And I think during that time, he should have done things to help me with the children. And I remember, I distinctly remember, and these are some of the red flags for me. Mm-hmm. I distinctly remember him in response to me asking him to help out more because he wasn't working, he was like, I don't do those things. Those are women tasks. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, my God. Girl, yes, he did. Oh, my God. And that's when I would say, (laughs) WWCD. What would Coretta do in these situations, right? You have an unemployed man who's chasing a dream. I get that. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. But I think that you have to demonstrate yourself as a man in terms of, holding down your family, supporting your wife, Mm -hmm. um, and being more concerned about people besides yourself. So did he know about your expectations? I mean, you you obviously you know had some oh, clear they were, expectations. They were clear, and that's okay. what led to the divorce. So after okay. two years of this type of behavior, Coretta had had enough. Okay. And so I said... Martin had to go. I gave him an ultimatum, and mm-hmm. I said, um, the house we were renting was going to be sold, so we had to move. And I said, either you get a job, and I don't care what you do. You can work at a bank. You can be a teller. Mm-hmm. How do you want your cash back from nine to five and chase your dreams at night? 
just to keep us in the black. Right. Um, our savings was being depleted. Mm-hmm. We were living beyond our means. And I wanted him to take substantial steps in the right direction to keep us afloat. Mm-hmm. To me, that demonstrates that you are part of this team um, and that we're not all out here just supporting you and your dream. Um, and he that's when he said, I want I want a divorce. Um, and I said, oh, OK, you know, game on. Mm-hmm. I think that he personally thought that that would have been a deterrent for me in in, in, in the sense that I would uh, detract and and want to try to work things out or acquiesce. But I had given him two years and, uh, you know, th- without anything really being produced. And, and it was also more of our friendship and our relationship and the bonding. I think being there for each other um, and supporting each other was not present in our marriage. And, and I think that's what led to the deterioration. So, okay, so when he said, I want a divorce, I don't want to move together, I mean, did that come as a total shock to you? Or were you kind of expecting it? Or, you know, why do you think he did it the way he did? He told me. He thought when I gave him that ultimatum, um, and, and the I want a divorce didn't come right away, that came after the okay. fact. So he thought, because he said, ha ha, I beat you to the courthouse. Oh. I think he really thought that I was going to file for divorce. And okay. to be honest, my intention was just to separate. And I was thinking that if my if I left him, myself and the kids, that would be a wake up call to him. That is this really worth losing your family? Right. Because that is essentially right. what he was doing. Um, but I've discovered that I was married to a narcissist. And there were times, when, you know, when, when, we, when he filed the paperwork and I got served, I originally was thinking, is that, you know, is this premature? Is there anything we could have done? But when you're married to a narcissist, there's really nothing that you can do. And they think about themselves before anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that has been evident uh, during our separation and our divorce and even post-divorce, who I was actually married to. And for that, I'm grateful because I'm grateful that we didn't wait. Right. Um, right. I don't know if you're spiritual, but I am. And, and I do feel like a lot of this happened for a reason. Absolutely. I feel like my steps have been ordered because so much has been good for me post-divorce. My energy is good. And we'll get to more of that later, I'm sure. But just divorce looks good on me and it feels good on me. Um, and I'm just glad that I'm 37. Uh, I'm glad that I didn't wait till I was 47 yeah. or 57 or yeah. 67 because it's not too late for me. And this is just the beginning of a new chapter. But I mean, think about that. I mean, you go, you bring up such a good point because a lot of people would be like, well, you're married. You've got kids. Just stick it out for the kids. You know, why would you break up the family? You know, you got these kids that need a father in the house. What would you say to those people? I mean, this is a it's a big step to get divorced. So how would you respond to the naysayers that would say, you know, Dana, You're in it for the kids. Just stick it out. It'll be okay. First and foremost, I have a daughter. And not only does she look like me, she's five. Mm -hmm. Not only does she look like me, but uh, we have a very similar personality. And what I've learned more than anything as of late is that my daughter and both of my kids are watching me. Yeah. Yeah. Kids watch. Yeah. Everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I am setting an example for my children, especially my daughter, in terms of how I should be treated. And I think that staying in a marriage where I felt like I wasn't supported, I wasn't loved, I wasn't treated the way I was supposed to be treated would be more detrimental than stepping out on my own, demonstrating my independence and showing my daughter that uh, I can be who I am And that I deserve more than what I was receiving in my marriage. And this is how a woman should be treated. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I had had concerns initially about, can I provide in a single parent household what what I expect in in a dual parent household, in a two parent household? And it has been nothing but love in my in my environment. I think we are everyone in my home is happier. Mm -hmm. Um. My family noted how sick my kids would often be wow. when we were married. Like sick how? Colds. Oh. Just, 
And I think it was a very stressful environment. It was a very mm-hmm. tense environment. Mm-hmm. My ex-husband wasn't working for two years. That's Chilling. Amazing. I would ask this clown to, to shovel snow. This was this was winter of 2013. And if you remember, yes. that was a very trying yes. winter in the city of Chicago. Right. My ex-husband wouldn't shovel snow. So I'm out there in these streets shoveling snow with all the other fathers and males of the households of my neighbors. So while you're out there shoveling that snow, what is he doing? Sleep. Knocked out. And it just I lost respect for him as, as a man. Um, I, I do believe that you can contribute to a household in non-financial means, mm-hmm. meaning that I didn't lose respect for him because he was unemployed. I didn't lose respect for him because he got laid off. I didn't lose respect for him because he was at home. I lost respect for him because despite all of that, he wasn't taking care of the home. He wasn't taking care of me as a wife. He wasn't taking care of his children as a father. And for that, I felt that the marriage had broken down. So did you guys... Consider counseling. I mean, I know that's something that, you know, a lot of people try. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But is it something that you guys tried or did you think about it once he said, you know, I want a divorce? We did go to counseling. Okay. And the problem with a narcissist is that it's difficult for them to accept the reality of them having issues or being flawed. Mm. So we went to counseling. Was it counseling just the two of you or was it marital counseling? Okay. It was marital counseling. Okay. And he wanted to stop going because he was like that man thinks with thinks you're right just because he likes you oh jeez okay he sides with you because you're right he picks you because mm-hmm. he likes mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. and i said well could it just be that i'm right yeah yeah you have valid points right and exactly. again being married to a narcissist there there is no recovery from that there is no cure mm-hmm. and so we stopped going. We we tried counseling, but it just it just didn't work. How long did you try? We did counseling for about eight months, and this was prior to we did counseling. So the marriage was in trouble um, shortly after my ex husband got laid off. But okay. the marriage was in trouble um, for for about two years before our divorce was finalized. Okay, so you were married a total of seven. So Correct. when did you start to feel the marriage kind of breaking down? That was year five or so. I would say so, yeah. Okay. I think, and I would say that having children is always very challenging mm-hmm. to any relationship. You're used to going out with somebody. You're used to spending time with somebody. It's just the two of you and being divorced, not being divorced, excuse me, getting married and having kids changes the dynamic. Being married didn't change our dynamic so much, um, in my opinion, but it was actually having children mm-hmm. and that lifestyle change. Mm-hmm. But I didn't see my ex-husband stepping up the way I felt a father should. My ex-husband was the type of person who was very deferential when it came to what he called woman tasks. And I think it's very important to demonstrate to your spouse that we are in this together. It's a team. Absolutely. It's a partnership. Absolutely. That's what marriage is. So for him to to say, you know, these are your tasks, these are my tasks, because that's what a woman should do. Absolutely. I mean, that's not how a household works, right? My ex-husband, he's from the South, and there's several explanations, I think, for his reasoning in terms of how he felt about women and their roles. But I was like, yo, clown, I was doing what the man tasks, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Yes. I was working, I had a six-figure job working mm-hmm. as an attorney. So if I'm doing what you consider to be the man tasks, then I expect you to do the woman tasks. Absolutely. And we're a team, yes. right? Yes. What we do as a couple and what we do as a married um, team is between us. Yes. And how we divvy out that tasks, those tasks are amongst us. But... For me, and, and that's kind of where I lost respect for him when I would ask him, you know, hey, can you bathe the kids tonight? Can you cook dinner? Can you do these things? Because what? I'm at work. Yes, I'm providing for the house. The response was, these are women tasks. These, you know, and it was like, and I'll never forget. One of the things for me that were huge red flags, like this, this ain't happening, this ain't working, was I was at work and we have caller ID. Mm-hmm. So, uh, my number came up. My name came up in the caller ID. Why? Because I'm paying all the bills. All the now. bills. It's in your name. Exactly. <laughs> and he called me and he was like, I decided. And I don't know what cup of courage he had had before <laughs> he called me. Uh huh. Yes. But he called me to say, I decided I want you to cook dinner for me tonight. So what's for dinner? 
And I had just been reamed by like a crazy boss, stressful environment as an in-house attorney. Um, and I was like, what are you cooking? What are you doing? He, he called, So he called me from home. He's at home. He's at home. You're at work. Correct. Right. Calling and me, asking me what's for dinner. Well, he's doing what? Chilling. Chilling. Yeah, that's so because because when he got laid off, he mm-hmm. wanted me to. I, so I was like, okay, this is because my I, w- I automatically went into partner mode, and I want to be very clear about that. I was very much supportive of my ex husband when I when he first got laid off because that's hard on anybody. It is as somebody who is into my career and has worked as hard as I have educationally to do the things that I've done and to be the person that I am in my career. I know what it's like to be laid off or to have difficulties and stresses at work. And so when he got let go, I immediately was like, okay, we're going to cut down on our nanny hours. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. These are the ways we're going to save money Absolutely. to make this work. Go from and he said, oh, no, no, no. We need our nanny full time because I'm out here chasing my dream. I'm out here doing my thing. And that to me was the breakdown because he wasn't willing to compromise or sacrifice to do what it takes. I believe in starting businesses. I believe in entrepreneurship. Yes. yes. But I think that you should also demonstrate your commitment and sense of teamwork to your family. You, you've got a family. And you know, you and got your family. Spouse. You got two kids. You Absolutely. Know, how are you just going to chill and work on your dream and not bring any money into the household? Absolutely. And you're down doing all the work talking about what are you going to cook? Absolutely. So when my name came up in the phone on the caller ID asking me, what I was preparing. Again, that was another major red flag to me, but I was like, this dude doesn't get it. This clown. This clown, tomfoolery. <laughs> it, it was just, but you know that that's not somebody who has your back. Wow. That's yeah. not somebody who values you as a wife. Um, and for me personally, like I've just, I've worked too hard. I've done too much to not be valued. And so that to me is what's, uh, you Irreplaceable. You can't really get. You can't really recover from that. You can't really get back from that. And that's why um, I don't mourn my marriage or or being divorced like others. Yes. Or like perhaps some people think I should, because I'm very clear that there's no there's no going back from that. If you're married to somebody who doesn't truly value you, they're never going to value you. Um, They may appreciate you in hindsight. But they're never going to value you in the present. So you're best to just move on. But you have to know your worth. Correct. Right. And a lot of women don't know their worth. Absolutely. So they stick with it and they're miserable, Very unhappy, true. doing it for the family, doing it for the kids, doing it because they had the vows. But the actuality, life is short. Absolutely. Very much so. And I was married to somebody. Part of the narcissism is about and also insecurity is about keeping you down, holding you back. And I distinctly remember um, we were on vacation, which he was opposed to taking because we were running out of money. But I felt like we needed as a family family, to kind of just bond and break. Right. And it didn't really cost us much. But I I confided in him and I told him my concerns about how we weren't making money. He wasn't making money and that we needed to do more to keep us in the black. Mind you, my ex-husband never submitted like one resume for any type of job, never interviewed, never did anything. And he owes an MBA from the University of Chicago. So he could have done something to keep our family afloat. Oh, 100%. I mean, he went to one of the top business schools in the country. That's correct. But is chilling, sleeping while you're shoveling snow. There you go. In the house, talking about what are you going to cook for dinner? Boom. Mm, So there were times where I had asked him, um, you know, can you please get a job? Can you please just do anything basic, to keep us in the right? black? Just to keep absolutely. Yeah. And his response to me was like, "Can you lose some weight? Can uh-uh, you go to the uh-uh, gym? Uh-uh. Can you Stop. go do this? And no. can you do?" Th- and so it was a, it was an no. attack uh-uh. on the personal character. <laughs> oh, oh. And oh. then once again, to me, it, it's demonstrative of the fact that you're not my teammate. No, you are not my partner. No, you are not my friend. No, because I was coming to him as a teammate, but he took personal affront to that. And responded in that manner. And that's how you know. Then that's to me. And I just want to be out there on that point in terms of married to men who are narcissists or just dating people who are narcissists in general. One of the key things that they do is try to tear you down Mm -hmm. and tear down your self-esteem. And it's so funny to me because 
he talks about how back then he was like, nobody's going to want you. Nobody's going to be interested in you. You've had babies. You look like you've had kids. And all of that was just playing with my mind. Of course. It manipulating would, yes. my mind. Whittling down my self-esteem for his own benefit. For his own ego. Absolutely. And so being free from that has been such a revelation to me because I do think, of course, I bring a lot to the table Yes, and I have a lot to offer and business is booming in the dating world, which has been great. And, and that's just reaffirming to me and reassuring to me that just I was meant to be divorced. I was not meant to be stayed married to this to this clown and it's all a good thing. And that's what I mean by like my steps have been ordered. Yes. Yes. And I believe you. I mean, listen, it, it's tough out there for some women, but I think if you have the attitude that you do, dating could be really fun. Dating can be great. Are you having fun? Girl, I'm having, talk to me about that. I'm having a ton of fun. So it doesn't scare you to be out there starting over with two kids. Some, some women might get a little fearful, but you seem like you are ready to mix and mingle. Girl, ready to single, ready to mingle. (laughs) Where are we going? Where are we going? I need you to be my wingman, Gabby. Do it. You know, Gabby's here. I am here for you. (laughs) Ready and available. I think dating is fun. And I think particularly having been married and, and out the game, so to speak, for 10 years, there's nothing more exciting to me than getting to know somebody, yeah. meeting somebody new, having those butterflies. Uh, I'm getting to know you. You're getting to know me. We're sharing experiences together. I feel like I'm in college or in high school, which is so exciting to me. And it should be, right? That's what dating and romance and all those things are all, is what it's all about. And it's funny because I've talked to a lot of people who have been divorced who often say to me, that second marriage is where it's at. Yeah. This tomfoolery has not made me give up on marriage. I just think I chose the wrong one. And which, you know, I, I beat myself up sometimes about who I married because I felt like at the time when I met my ex husband, I was I was twenty five. We went to college together, but we didn't meet till after college. But I felt like I had several options and I chose this one, which obviously was the wrong one. But everything happens for a reason because I have two great kids. Yes, you do. And one of the things that some of my single girlfriends who've never been married and who have never had kids have expressed to me is that you should be grateful even though you're divorced. When I was over here in my feelings, shoop, shooping, waiting to exhale <laughs> about my divorce, my girlfriends were like, slow down because you should be grateful yes. because you have two kids. Yes. I've got several friends who are like my situation is I'm 38 years old with no prospects out here in these streets and I don't have any children. And they want kids. And they want kids. And that clock is ticking. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> and so I'm grateful yes, for the fact that even though I'm divorced, I do have the beauty of having, I have a son who's seven and a daughter who's five and they are my world. Yeah. Um, and so right now, all I'm really looking for is companionship. Yeah, yeah. So I'm out here in these streets hustling. Trying to do what you do. Doing my thing. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> but I get good traction because people say to me, you, you're you such a breath of fresh air. One, because you're funny and you're, you know, you've got your laid back and your personality. Woo, woo, woo. But they also talk about how I'm not pressed, nor am I in a hurry to have children. Yes. Do you want any more kids? This is what I tell everybody. This is what I told my boo on Friday night. <laughs> What'd you tell him? I told him, I said, you know, I don't mind having any more children, but I'm, I do not want to have any more children by myself because that's what Agreed. I'm doing right now. I'm raising two children on my own. Yes. I'm in this parenting thing mm-hmm. by myself. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I was all up in my feelings, boo hooing. And my mother was like, you know, ta- I was expressing that I was feeling so alone. And in that moment, my mom was like, boo boo. You have always been alone. Mm. You were alone in your marriage. Mm. And so for people who have access and Mm -hmm. insight to your situation, Mm -hmm. to be able to tell you that you have really been in this game and in this struggle by yourself the entire time is very telling to you. And your mother knows. Absolutely. And so it's exciting to me to be able to date and to meet people and to experience 
relationships or potential relationships that enable me to um, find true companionship. Because that's what I'm looking for, especially having already had kids. And that's what you deserve. So you mentioned earlier that you have a son with special needs. And even though he's got special needs, your ex doesn't still step up for him. I mean, does he do you think that maybe contributed to the divorce in any way? This I think it actually goes back to the narcissism because my ex insisted that my son be named after him. Hmm. And I hate my husband's name, which we're not going to say on this <laughs> show, but it's just a coon name. So I don't even want to name my son after him. Mm-hmm. When I tell you, like I was in the delivery room after the baby was born. Yes. Like, <laughs> so beautiful. Can we please name him something else? <laughs> please, please. For the love of God. <laughs> and he was like, he was crying too, because this yes. is our firstborn. He yes. was like, this is so beautiful. <laughs> but no, like I'm <laughs> insisting that this child be named after me. And that's the narcissism, right? So I acquiesced and we named my son. He is the third. Okay. Um, So we call him Trey. That's his nickname. Um, My my ex-husband never thought that my son would have special needs. And I think it's an affront to him personally. So you feel he's embarrassed? Partially, yeah. He was definitely in denial for a very long time. And I think part of it is not being interested in... um, the the services that my son receives and also being interested in um, dealing with his individualized education plan and all the things that come with having a son with special needs. So my son has a speech delay, okay, basically, and okay. it amounts to there's difficulty with attention. Um, he has placed out of or has not been seen as having autism or Asperger's. They don't really know what is what is exactly going on with him. Okay. And so we're still in testing and trying to trying to monitor that now. But I have been in this discovery as to what's going on with my son by myself. Oh, boy. You know, can he play sports? Because I know that's a big thing for dads. He can. He- but he's not. It's funny because I always say that Trey is a lover and not a fighter. <laughs> so he is not the type of athlete that most dads would desire for their sons he's a strong swimmer but he's the kind of kid that is more interested in the social aspects of soccer okay versus which goal he scored a goal but it was was the wrong side (laughs) but he's got the concept But he's got the concept and he he does great he's athletic he's a very fast runner okay but trey is all about love but he's not going to be that football you know he's too sensitive as a kid i mean i I am raising ralph trezvan with a speech delay (laughs) Which is great. I love him. Yes. But he is not yes. hard charger, none of that. And I think that disappoints my ex because I think he wished and thought that he would raise a kid, but he wasn't even that kid, right? He played soccer. So what's the difference? He want as a narcissist, you want more for you think that your offspring is going to be different than, you know, and even better than what you are. Mm. And so he played, my ex-husband played soccer, but I was, so I was like, what makes you think you're going to have this like quarterback point guard, right? Track star. Right. Like, and so I think he has been disappointed in the, in the type of son that he's had, but that's life. It is. That's life. It is. So what would you recommend for women um, who might be going through the early stages of divorce? What would you recommend they do? Girl, save your money. <laughs> it's all about those pennies. <laughs> it's every penny. But I, but, I, but I will say that I think there is some um, I, I am blessed because I have never not worked. And I think that's very important. I have been very open with my story. Um, I went to Spelman College and. I have a Spelman Moms group where I'm very open about my divorce and my path and what I've been through. And I have truly been humbled by the responses that I've gotten on Facebook Mm -hmm. about people who have said, I've just appreciated you sharing your story and being so open about who you are and what you've been through. I think that, and I made a decision. I set a bar with our savings account. And I said, if it gets below this bar, I'm going to transfer my direct deposit, mind you, because I'm the only one bringing in some cash uh, up in mm-hmm. here. 
I'm going to transfer that money to my own account because I don't know what's going on here and I'm losing trust daily in this relationship. So I think that the financial freedom that I've had by working from by working and uh, having that has been truly helpful. I think that I wouldn't be anywhere without my support network and my support system. I've got great friends that I've had, people that I've known since high school, Mm -hmm. people that I've known from college, people that I've met out where I live now who have been truly supportive for me. And you can do anything with God on your side. Absolutely. And I think that having what I consider to be earth angels, which have been my friends who have stepped up for me, who've helped me move, who've come over with a bottle of wine, Mm -hmm. who are like, what can I do? Who have taken my children in moments of distress. Those have been the things that have been the points in time that have made it possible for me to get through all of this. I think that we shouldn't be afraid of divorce because I think it can be a very beautiful thing um, to just end the cycle of abuse. And, and and abuse doesn't have to be physical. My ex just like to be intimidating with words. And it's very important to uh, surround yourself with people who support you and celebrate you. And that has that has been a game changer for me in addition to having more financial freedom. So do you feel like your situation has affected your trust and confidence for future relationships? I'm certainly more cautious of Mm -hmm. who people are. And I firmly believe that it is, we could could have a whole nother segment about relationships and dating, but the representative is who shows up to these first dates. Absolutely. Particularly from any type of dating website or anything like that but just and just hearing stories of some of my other friends who are single but it's absolutely the representative who shows up to the first couple of dates i've met a lot of people from my profession and or college who now know that i'm single who are like hey Hey. how you doing (laughs) i'm so sorry i get the comforter shy role Mm -hmm. singing like lay down and tell me what's on your mind. I will comfort, comfort. And I'm like, all right, dude. Oh, gosh. That's cool and all. <laughs> they come strong. Huh? Girl, they, but because I think there's a perception about divorcees. Yes, there and is. And it's like, you know, they're coming in here trying to be all Garfield from Shy. Remember Garfield? Yeah, girl, do I? The fine girl, one. Girl, the fine one. What I will do? comfort. <laughs> comfort you <laughs> and I'm like dude like I'm yes. really straight yes. I'm cool I'm good um, I, it's not that yes. desperate for me the, mind you I have children so I'm not out here pressed <laughs> to have kids um, so I'm not my, my, I think my situation is different perhaps than some others but I think that dating has yeah. been very good to me <laughs> my friends have been very good to me my job has been very supportive and there are some people who fluctuate or vacillate between do I tell my company, you know, what I'm going yeah, through? Right. I was very transparent. I said, look, this is not going to be my best year, but I'm going to work my tail off. But I'm also going through a divorce. Yeah. And they were very supportive and positive in that regard, which has actually led to a lot of exposure to me. Um, within my company and my company has been very supportive of, of what I'm going through personally, which has actually been really great. And it's liberating because you feel like your job is secure when you know you're preparing for court, right. or you're preparing for some other deadline or whatever's going on in your personal situation. Oh, wow. That's good. Um, you know, you are unique because you, you are 37. You do have kids, so you don't have to, you know, men don't have to worry about that. But talk to me a little bit about the kids. How has this divorce impacted them? You've got a son and a daughter. Has it impacted them differently? Yes. My son, who is older, is seven. And when we first started the process and were separated, my son had a difficult time understanding that we would not be together Mm -hmm. as a family. So when he was with my ex-husband, he would ask for me. And when he was with me, there were times where he would ask for his father. And it took him a while to understand that we as a foursome, as a crew, would be no longer. 
And I think that that has been difficult for him. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, though, because my daughter, who is younger, but I think is a bit more clairvoyant, sees a lot of that because um, my children do not typically meet people that I date. Uh, but she actually happened to meet, and it was kind of funny, part, and, and I see why this all kind of happened in hindsight, but she had an opportunity to meet somebody that I was dating. It was a, a friend of mine from college okay. who I've known for like 20 years. Okay. And she was so excited. Really? Um, absolutely. My narcissistic husband... Uh, ex-husband moved into a one-bedroom apartment. Okay. So when my children spend every other weekend with him, they do not have a room or a place of their own. So it's not really a home for them. Correct. So they end up spending nights with him, and they come to me, and they seem a bit disoriented about um, sleeping by themselves and kind of getting acclimated to a regular bedtime schedule. So I spend about two days, two to three days uh, from when they come home, Reacclimating them to a more regularized schedule and then sleeping in their own beds. And it was very funny because a friend of mine had flown into town. We went to college together. We were dating, trying to see if there was some chemistry there. And he happened to, it wasn't planned, but he happened to be there. Um, and my kids were still there. And so my daughter was like, Is he going to stay at our house? And I was like, Do you want him to stay at our house? She was like, Yes. Oh. I was like, but you sleep in mommy's bed. She's like, I'll sleep in my bed. Oh, I will sleep by myself. Right. Like, she, she promised making room. She room. promised not to come in the room. And I was like, it's funny because it it makes me feel, and I think this is evident. I have a lot of people rooting for me. Yeah, I feel like I have a lot of cheerleaders who just want to see me do well. Yeah. People like me. They believe in my struggle. They believe in my path, and they're looking for my happy ending. And so. Um, I feel like one of my biggest cheerleaders is my daughter. That's and I think fantastic. She's five. And I think that she really understands what mommy's gone through, um, which has been which at is, five years old. At five years Isn't old. That amazing. Her insight, though, I think she understands that mommy was married to somebody, even though it is her father who didn't treat mommy well. Right. And so she's team mommy, team mommy. you know, and, and very interested in mommy. Um, Moving on and moving forward. And I think she understands how that can also be good for her. So how do you define true happiness? I think true happiness is, is with several things. I think, number one, you have to learn to love yourself and not be deterred by anybody who tries to thwart that theory or thwart that assumption of who you are. I was with somebody who spent a lot of time breaking me down. I think I present with a very strong personality, Mm -hmm. and I think that people don't know really what to do with that. I learned that. I know that is true from my job as an attorney, as a black female attorney, dealing often with men and people of different colors. I know that I have a strong personality, and I use that to my advantage in the the Mm -hmm. workforce. But when it comes to relationships, I, I chose to marry somebody who didn't celebrate that and instead was intimidated by that. And tried to tear you down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's about um, being with somebody and finding somebody who celebrates that. Right. And who doesn't want to tear that down and who's not intimidated by that. Um, So for me, happiness has really been identifying the people who are really with you in this process. Mm -hmm. It, it It is a struggle. Any type of hardship, divorce, birth, death, moving, whatever, you find out who your real people are. You find out who your village is. Yes. And there have been people who have literally, like in my darkest days, who've shown up to been like, I'm just going to go ahead and take your kids so that you can just kind of have a moment of time for yourself. I know you got a big court date coming up. I want to make sure that you're good. And I truly believe that there are some people who are your friends, who are really there for you. And there are other people who are in your life truly to bear witness to your potential failure. Yes. They are just sitting there eating the popcorn. Yes. Waiting waiting for you to stumble. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And in times of strife, particularly divorce, they will show their true colors. And so for me, happiness has been just kind of identifying and bonding and solidifying those relationships with those people 
who present and demonstrate that they are truly there for me. And I have truly been blessed because the number of people who've stepped up for me in one way or another has been amazing. And, and I am truly blessed. And I, and I, I think I have the best friends in the world. I think I have the best family in the world. I got the best mama in the world. And I couldn't be the lawyer that I am. I couldn't do all the community service and serving as board presidents and things like that that I do in my free time and my spare time without those people who support me. And that is critical to moving on into a new chapter like this. Having the courage to move on Mm -hmm. and move forward um, is impossible without that type of support. You gotta have that village, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting because you made such a good point about people are only there to see you fail or they wanna be there for the party, right? They just wanna celebrate. Absolutely. But when you have a death, divorce, anything tragic, people just kind of scatter away like roaches. So absolutely, I am very happy that you have that village. Now, speaking of parties, you had a divorce party. I sure did. Can we talk about that? Yes. Now, so tell, let me tell, tell you. Tell the listeners what a divorce party is. So let me tell you. I was, my as I knew my divorce was about to be final, and I love music. That's one of my hobbies and one of my things. But I was not trying to be up in some club at karaoke like, I will survive. <laughs> like, that's just so cliche to me it and just so not so cliche, high. yes. So what I decided to do. And I also wanted to celebrate the people who had been there for me. Music is a is a huge part of my life. So the summer before, when I had moved and we had separated, I threw a Michael Jackson barbecue for friends and family who had just been there to help me move and just get acclimated and get settled into our new situation. But I also wanted, and that was kid friendly. We had you know a lot of kid games and things. Yeah, my um, kids were there. Mm-hmm. We had a blast. Yes. The Thriller Turkey Burgers were that fire. Hot. But absolutely. So for my divorce party, I wanted to do something for adults and do something a little bit different. But I threw a murder mystery dinner party, which was so much fun. Um, people had people were assigned roles and costumes. And I purposely picked a wedding theme. Um, and it turned out to be so much fun. It's I've thrown a lot of parties because I'm a very social person, but it's the number one party that people keep asking about. And it was funny because um, when you're doing a murder mystery party, it's very important that you know that people are going to come because of the roles. You assign roles and somebody could be the killer. The people who are assigned the roles don't know if they're the killer. They don't know if they're dying. They don't know if they're the killer. They don't know what role they play in the actual murder until they show up. And it's funny to me because every single person, and my my divorce party was in April, which could be very cold in Chicago, every single person showed up. Every person. Nobody declined. I didn't have to reassign roles. And we had more people than we had roles for, so I ended up having to create roles, which was awesome. But we had such a good time. Everybody was into it. And we had just a blast. And so for me, it was much better than karaoke. No, no shade, if that's what you do. But it was a great way to celebrate, not only my friends. We had a great dinner. I served a full course dinner meal. With the wedding cake. With the wedding cake. Yes. Complete with the wedding cake, which is hilarious. And they, the bride and the groom, I had a wedding topper where they were holding guns. Um, it was funny. Everybody had a good time. And it was just a great way for me to celebrate my village. And I believe my village are the people who step up for me, both me personally, but also my children. And it's very, it was very personal to me. And we had a blast. Wow. Dana, you know, divorce is a tough, tough decision to make. And I just cannot thank you enough for your honesty, your candid conversation today, because I know your story is going to help out so, so many people. Absolutely. Not only women, but men that are considering this option. I just want to wish you all the best. Thank you, Gabby. I really, you know, you've got such a sparkle about you. You're ready to mix and mingle, possibly get married again. I really want you to come back and share some updates with us. Girl, I'm very us? excited. Let me tell you, because I'm so excited about this new chapter. A lot of good things are happening to me. And I do believe that courage is rewarded. If you have the courage to step out, sir saying get divorced. But if you just demonstrate that you have courage, it will be rewarded. Absolutely. And I truly believe that that has been my path. And I'm happy to share that message for Anybody who's willing to listen or who needs to hear that. And know your self-worth. 
Absolutely. Dana Michelle, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Gabby. I'm so happy to be here. The Gift of Gab Show, hosted by Gabby Smith, is sponsored by Bar Louie, located at 1325 South Halstead Street in Chicago. Go there for the handcrafted martinis, 30 beers on tap, and delicious food. Open seven days a week, 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. As Bar Louie always says, eat, drink, and be happy.